I'm glad you all could join us today. Um, we're going to talk about taxes in retirement and especially after the Tax Cuts and the Jobs Act of 2017. I have a little bit of background that I want to share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, there's, there, there's one picture of me that's uh, uh, pretty much what I look like. And uh, uh, I have been in this business for uh, some time, especially focusing on the education part of uh, working with clients. So uh, it is my pleasure to be presenting uh, a FIA curriculum for you uh, today. As you can see here, and that's an important thing that you notice, and that is um, I am, Kelly is, uh, and through our firm, we uh, are fully licensed and credentialed financial advisors with a broker-dealer affiliation with First Heartland Capital. So we would like you to keep your questions general in our uh, discussion today because every one of you has the opportunity to schedule a 15 to 20 minute uh, complimentary phone consultation. So uh, any questions that you have that are specific to your circumstances, we want to be sure uh, that you have the opportunity to, to ask those in a confidential uh, uh, telephone call. But general questions, you can enter in the chat box and we will address those uh, as best we can, uh, helping all of you to uh, learn more. Sometimes the questions that people ask make the message that we're conveying more clear. So we want to be sure that you understand a little bit about a FIA. Now you will all be given an opportunity to have an account because everything is called an account, right? You'll be able to have a, uh, an account and a dashboard with a FIA. I really recommend that you do that because it's got uh, a lot of uh, calculators there. It's got uh, information about various financial subjects. It has no affiliation with any commercial enterprise whatsoever. A FIA is, as it states in the nonprofit mission, uh, an organization that exists to inform and empower Americans to take control of their finances by providing comprehensive financial education in communities nationwide. So it's our hope to enlighten you to your options and enable you to become more financially empowered and have a better understanding of uh, the taxation and other aspects of your finances. So a little bit about, again, about a FIA, how our FIA is funded. Uh, there are some advanced courses that uh, have tuition involved. There are chapter sponsorships. We have a chapter here in Bernie, and that chapter is something that we sponsor, Lesnick Company sponsors. There are also the opportunity for people to make personal donations. Uh, this has happened occasionally, and we appreciate it when it does happen because we are all um, volunteering our time and any donations that we receive enhance um, the resources that we can make available to people. But they are not necessary. But actually, when we get them is when we have been able to solve a big problem for someone and answer a question that was uh, lurking in their mind. And then also there are membership dues. This is not for you. I want to be sure that you understand that when you um, establish your uh, account on, and a dashboard, you will not be asked to pay membership dues. Membership dues are paid by member firms like financial uh, planning uh, organizations like us. We pay membership dues so that AFIA can continue to develop uh, curriculum that we can deliver to clients. So you can become a member. Again, there's no membership dues. Uh, there's a lot of financial tools, as, as I uh, mentioned earlier. They're, it's all free. There's financial calculators, and you will also be informed of AFIA events that are happening in your community. Uh, so anytime that there's something that is of interest to you in this virtual 
uh, environment in which we are all residing now. I think that this has become a very um, a widespread opportunity for people to get information even outside of their own opportunity or their own uh, geographic area because you don't have to be there to attend uh, the seminar or class. So uh, you'll get this information. You'll be sent a link for this with the chapter ID. You will get this as a result of having uh, attended this today. And we really encourage you to do this. So uh, I need to read this disclosure. I promise there's only one, but it, as it, and I will read it word for word. AFIA, the American Financial Education Alliance, is recognized by the IRS as a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization that provides educational workshops and classes in businesses and universities nationwide. Our instructors are licensed and trained financial professionals with a minimum of five years of real world experience in their field. They've been required to pass a series of training sessions on how to properly educate in a not for profit setting before becoming a personal financial coach and instructor with. AFIA. AFIA courses and workshops do not promote or endorse any specific products or companies and no selling is allowed. AFIA educational workshops and courses are for general education only and are not intended to be construed as investment, tax, legal, or financial advice. Attendees should seek the assistance of a professional familiar with the course prior to implementing any of the ideas or strategies taught or discussed in the course. Hypothetical and or actuarial hysterical historical returns contained in this presentation are for informational purposes only and are not intended to offer, solicit, or become a recommendation. Rates of return are not guaranteed and for illustrative purposes only. Projected rates do not reflect the actual or expected performance within any example or financial product. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Okay, so we are through that and we now uh, get to the uh, point of explaining to you that we are not employed, affiliated or endorsed by the IRS or the Social Security Administration or any other government agency. This presentation is not intended and it should not be construed as tax advice. We're, we encourage you to be in contact with your enrolled agent, your CPA, your attorney, or any other professional that you think can be helpful to you in making decisions. All the examples we use are hypothetical and for illustrative purposes only. We're not talking about any solutions for financial um, situations, so actual results were varied does not really apply here. And uh, we are not talking at all about any kind of strategy product or anything like that in this in this presentation. We're talking about tax and we're talking about how taxes need to be viewed in retirement. So the goals of our, our meeting today is to understand the relevant changes to personal income tax under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. We also want to be sure that you have an understanding of the impact that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act ha may have on your retirement income streams. We also want to identify tools and strategies that are available to middle income retirees and we will avoid the political and stick to the actionable. And what we mean by that is that we aren't offering opinions of one political party or another. We are focusing on things that are in place and can be accessed or not as it advantages or disadvantages you. So one final note before we get started. We're going to focus on married filing jointly uh, statistics because that's our most common attendee to the seminars. But for other filing statuses, such as single or head of household, the principles remain the same. So there is virtually no difference. It's just what our uh, examples will show MFJ married filing jointly. So, 
Here's something that I think we all would agree with. American tax laws are constantly changing as our elected representatives seek new ways to ensure that whatever tax advice we receive is incorrect. So uh, Dave Barry, as we all know, he's a, uh, a humorist who can ba basically take the facts of life and turn them into something humorous. And uh, it certainly does seem to me, having been in the financial industry for as long as I have, that uh, this is exactly true. Whatever advice we receive, it seems as though there's always something afoot in the Congress to change that and make it incorrect. I mentioned that I've been in this business for some uh, period of time. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, most of us see that the tax reform is confusing, okay? If you don't know what to think of it, uh, you're not alone. And there's a, another little wrinkle that's been thrown into our lives. And that is because we did not actually have to file tax returns in the normal way of doing business this year with the filing date extended to July. We have heard from many of our clients that, gosh, I don't even really know what happened with my 2019 taxes. I mean, I, I got them in, but oh my gosh, I don't know what was going on. So, so you might not have a full grasp of what uh, tax reform did to you. But I didn't understand much about tax laws when I first began my career in financial services. So that was a while ago. Uh, I'm sure that some of you who are watching this recognize the gentleman that is sitting at the table uh, with me. It's Marlon Perkins. And Marlon Perkins was the host of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. So in our family, that was part of the Sunday evening ritual. That's sort of the wind down uh, before the week began, the work week began, was to watch Wild Kingdom. I had the opportunity to meet Marlon on numerous occasions. As a matter of fact, I actually received a jacket like this and uh, sold it in a, a yard sale at one point in time. But now this seems to be coming back in vogue. Maybe I should have hung on to it. But my relationship with financial services and taxes goes back quite some time. All right, well, let's get into the subject matter of the day. So in theory, it's pretty straightforward and extremely similar to the system before tax reform. And that is, as you go up in income, the rate you pay also goes up. But the new brackets have lower rates at each step, which is why most people will pay less under the uh, new tax system. Now these tax rates are in place until 2026. They will sunset in 2026. But this tax structure was specifically designed for ordinary income, which includes wages, most IRA withdrawals, pension income, and interest. And we focus on this because these are the sources of income that most of our clients are facing. That is the sources of income. Some of our clients are still working, but many are withdrawing from their IRAs and receiving some kind of pension, uh, social security, and of course, investment income is uh, part of the equation as well. So I know that we've all filled out paper tax forms. So if, if that is the case, okay, we've seen a more complex version of the tax brackets. I like this example that Afia has given us here because this makes it easier to understand. Now, this is the 2020 bracket. There's a very slight variance from what you may have filed earlier this year for 2019. But there is a base amount and then the rate for the amount above. So when people filled out paper forms, this representation makes it easier to realize that only a thin income falls into a given bracket. 
and it is taxed at that rate. So what you're seeing here, okay, if you're following through here, the taxable income column on the left, and we'll take, we'll go into the 19,751 to 80,250. The tax on that is 1975 plus 12% on the amount over 1975. So what you can see is that number, that 10% from the lower bracket carried into the next bracket, and then it was 12% of the amount over $19,750. Sometimes people are confused about whether all of their uh, income will be taxed at the higher rate, and that's not the case. So let's look here at this uh, ordinary income tax map. This might make it a little easier to understand and to visualize the, ta the tax brackets. Okay, so we call this a tax map because it illustrates the rate at which each additional dollar of ordinary income would be taxed. In retirement, the two most common sources of income are uh, pension income and withdrawals from IRA accounts. Both of those are considered to be ordinary income and taxed as income. Okay. So notice that from zero to about $27,400, there is no tax. That's the, the far left of the graph. You can see there is a, a thin line and if you look at the uh, corresponding numbers down below, you will see that the uh, number, as it says here, is about 27,400, okay? So that's due to a larger standard deduction plus an additional $1,300 each as both clients in our illustration are over the age of 65. We'll discuss that a little bit more in a few slides forward. From about 27,400 to just over 47,000, income falls into the 10%. So only the income that falls into that range gets taxed at 10%. That first 27,400 does not get taxed at all. Just the difference gets taxed. For income that falls between 47,000 and 107,000, that's taxed at 12%. So if those ranges look odd to you, it's because we've included the standard deduction for married couples, okay? So it may not be exactly what you thought it was because again, we've included the deduction. So we reduced the income by uh, the standard deduction. And we're gonna talk about the standard deduction uh, for married couples, which will be, a, again, a few slides down the road, okay? So there are two spots in this road roadmap that I really want you to pay attention to. They are big jumps, okay? You, do you see them? Uh, the jump from zero to 10 is a pretty high step. Then you see there's a small step from 10 to 12, okay? Then there's a big jump from 12 to 22, then 22 to 24 is not much of a jump, but then from 24 to 32 are where, and that is where the biggest opportunities for planning lie. What do we mean by opportunities for planning? Well, if you have one of those big jumps, it may be worth your while to investigate whether there are things you could do to reduce your income. Um, and we'll talk about some of those strategies as we move forward, okay? So we actually have hit on a very important concept by uh, looking at those tax brackets, and that's the concept of marginal tax rates. Your marginal tax rate is the rate you paid on your last dollar of income. You may recall that uh, in looking at a summary that you've received from your tax preparer, that it will have your tax bracket and then it will have your marginal rate oftentimes at the bottom. So we wanna understand 
what that is. The tax, your marginal tax rate is the rate you paid on the last dollar of income. Well, let's talk about some other um, income issues, uh, income tax issues that people face, or tax issues, I should say. Didn't mean to say income. And that is capital gains and qualified dividends. They get a different treatment. Now, this was a major change in the Tax Reform Act in 2017. Okay? And that is specifically that the brackets were directly linked, linked to ordinary income, whereas now they stand alone. Okay? So the public policy goal was to encourage investment. And we'll, we'll see that on the next slide. The marginal tax concept, uh, ordinary income, a similar concept, only the amount above the threshold is taxed at the higher rate. So prior to that, at, to the act, the brackets were linked directly to ordinary income brackets. All right, so let's look and see what that actually means. So that means if your taxable income is between zero and $80,000, and remember your taxable income is after the standard deduction is applied, then your capital gains bracket is zero. And again, this was to encourage investment, to encourage people to invest and not be concerned about the impact of capital gains when they wanted to uh, what we call harvest some gains and put more money into their uh, portfolio or into their bank account. You can see from $80,000 to $496,000 of taxable income. That's a very large um, framework there. That uh, has capital gains taxable at 15% and above $496,601 capital gains are taxed at 20%. Okay, so we only get up to the $15,000 capital gains rate for gains that would fall into the 22% bracket in the new system. The 20% tax uh, capital gains rate applies where the old 39.6 ordinary income bracket would have begun. So the tax bill didn't dramatically change capital gains opportunities for high income earners. It was designed to benefit those middle Americans with not who were not the ultra wealthy. So again, here's a tax map. So if you only had dividends and capital gains on your tax return, and this were your scenario, that was all the income you had, you would pay zero until you had enough to fill the 12% ordinary income tax bracket. And, there's, and that's reduced by $200 for 2020. For taxpayers in the highest ordinary income bracket, and you can see that that's where well over to the right, that's that four, not $496,000 number, um, capital gains is taxed at 20%. So it's really important concept because it shows how capital gain taxation is actually linked to ordinary income. Once the combination of capital gains plus ordinary income pushes you above the threshold, your capital gains becomes taxable at 15%. This structure really didn't change under the new tax bill, but because of the new larger standard deduction, the range at which it impacts you changes. Now, you will see, and we'll provide some information for you at the uh, close of our seminar, you can reference some um, publications that the government has uh, prepared that will give you a clearer understanding, or allegedly so. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is to talk about changes in deductions, exemptions, and credits, okay? These are all things that reduce your net federal tax bill and effectively make the first several thousand dollars in your household income tax-free. Let's talk about deductions first of all. 
an amount deducted from taxable income. That's what a deduction is. The standard deduction is $24,800 for married people or $12,400 for single people in the year 2020. Alternatively, if you itemize deductions on a Schedule A, mortgage interest on debt up to $750,000 of acquisition debt is um, deductible. That does not include HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit. Also, um, I know we have at least one person who's joined us from California. California has put a cap on that and we're, we're talking about the federal rules here, not the um, California rules. Charitable gifts of cash or a check up to 60% of income are also deductions. Many people who are uh, near the end of their uh, lives uh, have turned their uh, income into charitable deductions and can give up to 60% of their income and if in the case that they do that, they would not want to use the standard deduction. Instead, they would be itemizing. And then state and local property taxes up to $10,000 are um, a deductible expense. There is also an additional deduction uh, for those 65 and over, mentioned earlier at $1,300. And uh, if, but if you're single, it's $1,300. $1,300. If you are a married couple, $1,300 each. If you are single, it's $1,650. So this was retained in the new tax law. It's actually unchanged from the 2019 levels. So what about exemptions? Well, the personal exemption is gone. For 2018, the personal exemption would have been 40 150 or $4,150 per person in the household. In general, for a couple, the combination of the personal exemption and the standard deduction would have been slightly less than the new standard deduction. There are a lot of people who are concerned that they may have been disadvantaged by the tax, the change in the tax law. The attempt was to simplify things, especially for those in retirement who may have reduced income. Keep in mind, you still have the opportunity to itemize. So you, you haven't lost anything, but you may have gained simplification. Another thing that we want to talk about is credits. Okay, So deductions and exemptions reduce your taxable income which indirectly reduces your tax bill. Credits, on the other hand, directly reduce your tax bill. Tax credits are specifically designed to incentivize behavior. And two of the most common tax credits are the healthcare tax credit and the earned income tax credit. A less common one, but one that may be accessed by some people who take a part-time job in retirement is the savers credit which basically incentivizes lower income people to save into retirement accounts. So even if you've been a high earner all of your life, your tax return may be set up to present you as a low tax earner between the point of a formal retirement and the time you are forced to begin taking retired required minimum distributions. You do not have to take required minimum distributions, or as we call them in the industry, RMDs, you don't have to take those now until age 72. So between the time you've stopped working, and perhaps you stopped working at 65 when you were Medicare eligible, between 65 and 72, you have the opportunity to do some significant tax planning. You also have the opportunity then to perhaps access um, a savers credit by taking part-time work. Those are individualized situations and should be discussed um, specifically uh, your plans uh, to, to perhaps take advantage of the savers credit. Okay, so let's talk about 
uh, now summarize we'll sh the uh, deductions, exemptions, and credits. Okay, so income subject to tax down to the total tax need. Wait, excuse me. I just I was reading across the column. Please excuse me. Here's an example, okay, of a couple with $38,000 of gross income that is all ordinary income. At least $2,000 of the income must be in the form of wages. So first, we reduce the income by the standard deduction. Okay, for a married couple filing jointly, plus the additional de deduction for 65 plus. And then we take, so that's right, right here, $24,800 standard deduction plus $1,300 times two gives us a total deduction of $27,400, okay? They also there were taking advantage of part-time work in retirement and made a $2,000 IRA contribution. That is also deductible. So the income that is subject to tax is $8,600. That puts them in the 10% tax rate. So their tax would actually be $860. But because they're saving money in the IRA, they're getting the savers tax credit for the IRA contribution. So they, in fact, owe nothing in taxes. So remember, credits are different than deductions and exemptions. They directly reduce your tax bill. So you can see that the savers credit eliminated the tax bill in this case. So now let's look at middle income married filing jointly brackets. Remember how our tax map showed no tax up to $27,400. That was the impact of the new standard deduction plus the additional deduction for being over age 65 or blind. So you can see on the, this um, map where the taxation begins. So I wanna talk about the real tax system, okay? We wanna talk about required minimum distributions, capital gains, social security benefits, Medicare premiums, how those might affect your tax situation, potential Roth conversions or large withdrawals from IRAs, and the 3.8% net investment income tax. Okay. If that were all there was to the tax system, it would be uh, that we viewed on the prior page, that would be pretty simple. But in retirement, we see several complicating factors. So let's go through these. Let's talk first of all about RMDs. You're subject to RMDs when you reach age 72. So there is a factor that is published every, uh, well, it doesn't actually change. It, it, uh, the factor is the same. It depends on what your balance is. So you divide your prior year's ending account balance by your remaining life expectancy. Your life expectancy is not a guess on your part. It's a table that's provided by the IRS. So if you had a $500,000 balance on December 31st, that $500,000 is going to be divided by 25.6. So the amount that you must take as a deduction or as a distribution in that year is $19,532. So accessing that table will tell you at the end of each year what your taxable income is going to be. I think that uh, it, it has fallen up um, out of the limelight because of RMDs being waived this year, but I encourage you to, to uh, pay attention to this because I doubt that we're going to have a waiver of required minimum distributions uh, next year. 
So how do RMDs work? Let me continue a little bit with the chart so that you'll see the distribution period. You see what the this uh, distribution period, the second column, that's what the government table shows your life expectancy expectancy to be. So each year as you age, your life expectancy goes down by less, by, by one year. So that table runs all the way out to age 115. And even at age 115, you only have to take out a little bit more than half of the prior year's ending balance. So no big deal, right? But the key here is if you've done a good job of saving into your retirement, your minimum distributions plus your Social Security uh, income may be more than you actually need to sustain the lifestyle you want to live. So if that's the case, you'll be likely paying more in taxes on the back end than you could be. And we will show you that in just a few slides. Uh, Sometimes when I'm talking to someone who has not yet retired, one of the things that the questions that we want to bring up is if you are nearing retirement and still deferring, are you deferring to a higher bracket? That might be the case and it's worth studying and understanding. Well, let's talk about capital gains. So if you're like many people, you think that there's a 15% tax only when you sell something that's appreciated. Not really something to be concerned about. But what you do not realize is that you can also recognize capital gains even without selling anything, particularly if you own mutual funds. This is a very important factor. It's called phantom gain. I hope that we don't experience it to the extent that we did in uh, the past decade, but it's possible that we will. Okay, Let me explain to you how it works. Say Mutual Fund A bought Apple stock in 1985. Okay? You bought into that mutual fund in 2019 and you held it all the way through 2020. In the middle of 2019, the fund manager decides that Apple is no longer an investment he wants to hold and he sells the entire position. Any gain that was recognized on the sale of that stock must be passed through the mutual fund to the current shareholders, even if they didn't participate in any of the gain of the underlying stock. Sorry, I hit, hit a button there that I didn't intend to hit. So it's an that's an important factor to keep in mind if your investments are principally in mutual funds because the, the nature and the makeup of mutual funds changes from time to time based on the strategy that's imp uh, implemented by the fund manager. You have no control over that. So again, you want to be aware of that. So it, if you have invested in non-qualified money, in other words, if you have money in, in investment accounts that you did not take a deduction on, you are also uh, generally subjected to capital gains tax if you sell those positions. Okay. If you're a buy and hold uh, investor, it's likely that you will recognize at least some capital gains in some years because you will be required most likely to sell some positions in order to provide for your needs. So most importantly, when you experience a capital gain on your return, it can have a greater impact than just the tax on the gain because it uh, uh, increases your adjusted gross income and that may cause other deductions to lose their value. So again, these are, I, I understand that, that there's confusion in this and I think that the uh, important 
point that I want to be sure everyone understands is that it is confusion. It is confusing. You can't ignore these things in retirement because they can be tax surprises that uh, you weren't uh, prepared for. I just have to take an aside and say we had a, uh, a client who decided to cash in a, an investment to pay off a property that uh, he didn't want to carry a mortgage on any longer. Um, the result was he had a surprise income tax bill of $16,000 in addition to what he thought his tax bill would be. We weren't part of that decision, but uh, we were made aware of it and helped him determine how he could avoid uh, something like that in the future. Now, let's talk about the taxation on Social Security. Okay. Social Security is taxed based on your other income. It's a counterintuitive nature of how minimum distributions interact with capital gains, for sure. But Social Security is, is something that's fairly cut and dried, and I want to be sure that you understand it. Most advisors will say up to 85% of your benefits are going to be taxable. Okay. For high income people, 85% is going to be taxable and 15% is tax free. For middle and upper middle income folks, that's sometimes not true because it's based on a formula called provisional income, which can have some strange impacts. I don't expect that you're going to walk away from here being an expert on provisional income, but at least I want you to feel as though you've had an introduction to it and understand that it has an impact on your taxation. Because remember, tax is based on income. Okay? Provisional income, your provisional income includes half of your social security benefit and all other taxable income, including dividends and realized capital gains, interest plus non-taxable interest earnings, such as from municipal bonds, okay? plus all other taxable income includes distributions from your retirement plans. So that's what makes up provisional income. Let's take a look at this. So once we've calculated the provisional income, it's time to apply the thresholds to determine the taxation of Social Security. So the key here is that only the provisional income that falls over the threshold creates taxable Social Security. Okay. So if you have, are a single person and you have provisional income at $25,000 or less, then 50% of your Social Security is taxable. If your provisional income is over $34,000, 85% of your Social Security is taxable. For married folks, 50% is the, of your Social Security benefit if you will be taxed. If your income is over $32,000 and if it exceeds $44,000, it will be 85%. As I'm saying that, I'm recognizing that I'm, I stated the first single person um, incorrectly. That is, if your income is $25,000, anything $25,000 and above is 50% taxable up until 34,000. And then the 85% rate applies. If your provisional income is less than $25,000 as a single person, your social security benefit is not taxable. If it's less than $32,000 as a married couple, then your social security benefit is not taxable. So, that seems 
to most people. And so something that can't be attained. And if you have pension income, that may in fact be true. But many times we find that people can get themselves to a zero tax bracket by some very careful planning as they approach retirement or in the very early years of retirement. So that's worthy of exploration. Let's give an example of what we talked about on the tap on the last page. We'll do two examples, okay? And both of these have $60,000 of household income. In the first, we have $20,000 of social security income and $40,000 of IRA withdrawals. We take half of the social security income and add that to the IRA withdrawals and we come up with $50,000 of provisional income. Then we apply the first threshold for a married couple that's $32,000. Well, we're $18,000 over that threshold and 50 cents of each benefit dollar over the threshold becomes taxable. So we have $9,000 of taxable social security there. Now we apply the second threshold, which is $44,000. We're $6,000 over that threshold and 85 cents of every dollar over that threshold becomes taxable here. So it creates an additional $2,100 of taxable income. We already picked up the first 50 cents on each dollar in step one, which is why we only multiply by 0.35 here. In other words, even though we have $60,000 of household income, only 55% of the social security benefit is taxable. Now let's take another example. We still have $60,000 of household income, but in this one, we have $40,000 of social security and $20,000 of IRA withdrawal. We take half of the social security and add it to the IRA, IRA withdrawal to get to the provisional income of $40,000. We are $8,000 above the first threshold, which creates $4,000 of taxable income, but we're still under the second threshold. So $40,000 of social security income, $36,000 of that is tax-free. Only 10% of the social security benefit is taxable. This is an important thing to realize when you're making decisions on drawing on social security or not. If you're near these thresholds, it may very well be that you want to carefully consider when that social security benefit should become part of your income. It may be to your advantage to draw down on IRAs rather than to access the social security funds. On the other hand, sometimes we find that cannibalizing the assets in order to have a higher social security benefit later doesn't make sense from an income standpoint. So that has to be carefully weighed with a tax uh, impact. So when we bring these numbers to the tax return, right, we see it a bit more clearly. The $40,000 of IRA and $20,000 of Social Security blend results in $2,449 of federal income tax. And you can run through the figures there, the taxable Social Security, the other taxable income. So the total taxable income being $51,000 minus the standard deduction. So the net taxable income is calculated. The opposite blend creates no federal income tax at all. So let me step back to that and, and run through that. Be sure that you're, you're seeing that. The taxable Social Security in that example was $4,000. 
the other taxable income is $20,000. So the total taxable income getting the same $60,000 in distribution was $24,000. Apply the standard deduction and there's zero tax. That's something that is important to understand again because one of the things that we sometimes say in um, our examples is which horse should you ride? Should you ride the horse of the uh, of your retirement income that you saved or should you first get on the uh, the horse that is the social security? It's a, it's a delicate balance and we want to be sure that, we, that we're making good decisions. So there's an, let's move on to another situation that uh, affects people. And that is IRMA. It is the Medicare excess premium. Okay? And this is again for married filing jointly in the year 2020. Okay? If you have income of less than $174,000, then your part B annual premium is $1,735, which means you pay no additional uh, Part B premium. Okay. So that's a per, per person uh, amount. At $174,000 to $218,000, your Medicare excess premiums are uh, $2,428. Let me, let me step back for just a moment. This is an increase in the amount of, just a second, I'm doing a quick calculation here. Okay, this is, no, this is the Part B annual premium, and that, this is the standard premium. It changed a little bit in 2020. We've just you know finished working with 2019 taxes, so. There, that's where we um, uh, derive that number. So taxable income can affect the amount of money that you're going to pay for Part B of Medicare. And nearly uh, everyone that we see is paying uh, a Part B premium. Part D, D is the drug benefit. Below $170,000 household income, you're going to only pay for whatever the cost of your, your plan is. If you step into that higher income bracket, you're going to pay uh, $146.40 more uh, per year for your drug coverage. So what you can see here is that Medicare, although Part A, there's no premium paid in retirement. Let me let me clarify something here. Sometimes people say there is no premium for. Uh, there is no cost to Part A. That's not true. You ha there has been a Medicare tax applied during your working years, and that's what covers uh, Medicare Part A. And when you begin to access Medicare, apply for Medicare and begin and enroll to receive benefit is when you will pay a Part B premium. Sometimes people think that Medicare is free uh, it's not. It's insurance, and it has a premium structure, as any other does. In this case, however, with Medicare, the cost is not based on your age. It is instead based on the income that shows up on your tax return. Now, there's so which and that means that it is means tested. Now there's one other uh, thing I want to mention here, and that is people may have been in a higher uh, bracket prior to retirement. We may have, we're frequently talking to people who may have been in the, uh, the third bracket down 218 to $272,000 during working years, but now they've retired, that salary has stopped, and perhaps their income is actually now below $174,000. If that is the case, then there is a form that can be filed and sent to Medicare to have them consider your new income circumstance and 
charge you the appropriate Part B premium. Um, this is those of you who um, have concern about whether or not the uh, the government gets the numbers right. I want to tell you something that has never failed to be true in our practice. And in fact, uh, one of the instructors that I get a lot of my information from said she has never seen Medicare not be accurate in charging the premium, appropriate premium, so long as they have the correct information. So you may have retired and you see that your 2020 premium, the bottom line there on the small print under the chart says premiums for 2020 are based on 2018 income levels. So you need to file that appeal if your income level is no longer uh, high because the threshold or the, the, the uh, calculation is based on your income two years prior. They get that information from your income tax return. Okay, so that is, um, it's worth paying attention to the thresholds because you want to consider how much to take from various accounts. And that's a very important part of income planning in retirement. Let's talk a little bit about the 3.8% net investment income tax. It impacts higher income taxpayers. It creates an additional 3.8% tax on net investment income, which includes capital gains and dividends, interest and annuity payments, passive business income and rents. So some high income uh, retired folks are receiving their uh, income from rental income. While that is not the same as uh, IRA income or pension income, it is in fact subject to the 3.8% net investment income tax. Basically, if it's not derived from work or a return on your own capital, and it falls over the $200,000 or $250,000 of adjusted growth income threshold, it is likely subject to the 3.8% additional tax. So that also can have an effect on how people view their income streams in retirement. Those are sophisticated uh, decisions, but important to be made. Let's talk now about uh, the PEP, the Personal in Exemption Phase Out and the PEAS Act. Okay? Those were eliminated in the Tax Reform Act that we're discussing today. Okay? So those were previously available, but because of the inaction of the higher exemption, these are no longer applicable. So people who may have had those as uh, part of their calculations in the past no longer have them. Let's talk about alternative minimum tax. This is the final distortion and they, it again only applies for people who have higher incomes and a lot of deductions. The alternative minimum tax or the AMT is a flat tax that runs parallel to our normal tax system. So prior to tax reform, it was estimated that fewer than 4 million taxpayers would be subject to the AMT. Okay. Tax reform significantly increased the threshold and now it will apply to only about 200,000 taxpayers going forward. So. Um, if you're likely to be one of those people, the odds are you would already know this, and it's definitely an area that your CPA is probably talking to you about. We don't encounter it in our uh, practice very often. Okay, let's talk now about effective marginal tax rates. The complications we've just outlined should highlight one major point, and that is over time, our government has needed new tax revenues. 
and if this were if we were face to face I would be asking for a show of hands now is how many of you think that taxes might go up in the future based on the government spending that has happened so far this year anyway over time the government has needed more tax revenue so uh, the method has not been to change rates or brackets so much instead it's been introduced as a phase out of deductions or exemptions or to begin to include income that was previously not taxable like social security benefits at one time social security benefits were not taxable so the result is a tax system and with the most important number is not necessarily the bracket you're in but instead it's the effective marginal rate in other words how much of your last dollar did you actually lose to federal income tax so let's revisit the tax map remember as you increase ordinary income from left to right across the bottom you can see that the rate in, applies to the next dollar. I think you can see these, these increases at which each of these dollars is taxed. It's a progressive tax. And here's the map for capital gains. So again, no tax on capital gains under that uh, number that is uh, between uh, at about $94,000, at about $94,000. Then a 15% rate, so we go across and then jump up to the 20% rate. Again, these capital gain rates were adjusted in order to help uh, people invest, encourage them to invest. All right, so let's take a look at a case study. Let's look at the real tax system here. John and Jane, they are married, filing jointly, and they're over the age of 65. They have $60,000 of combined Social Security income. They have $10,000 of long-term capital gain this year and a $52,000 IRA withdrawal. Here's their tax map. You can see that once they harvest a little over $10,000 in ordinary income, they begin to experience an 18.5% effective marginal tax rate. That's the point that their ordinary income plus capital gains drags enough Social Security into the calculation to begin making every additional dollar withdrawn from an IRA taxable at 10%. And each additional dollar over that drags another 85 cents of Social Security into the mix. So that creates an effective marginal tax rate of 18.5%. You can see that this couple never actually experienced a 10% rate or a 12% rate. They go from 18.5% to 22.2 to almost 50% before dropping back down into the regular brackets. So 49.95, how did that happen? If you're saying, well, wait a minute, that spike occurred at the 12% bracket, how did that happen? Well, intuitively, this couple is in the 12% bracket for ordinary income. You would expect $1,000 of additional withdrawal to create 12% or a tax of $120. But here's what actually happened. The $1,000 withdrawal did get taxed at 12% or $120. But then that caused $850 of Social Security benefit to become taxable adding another $102 to the tax bill, which then together caused $1,850 of capital gains that would have come through at zero to become taxable, resulting in another $277.50 in federal income tax. In short, 
on that withdrawal, they lost 49.95% of that additional withdrawal to federal income tax. This is a this is something that in when we are uh, all together in a room really causes some consternation on the part of people viewing this because the example that I used sometimes is that, and I've not actually done this myself, let's say it comes close to Christmas time and I want to buy some gifts for the grandkids so I just think, well, I'll, I'll just take another thousand dollars out of my IRA, thinking that that's not going to have much of a uh, of an impact. But you can see that in this particular situation, instead of one hundred and twenty dollars in additional tax, it bumped everything else up. So the additional tax on that became the additional total tax burden on the return became. $499.50. More than anything else, I think it's important that you, we understand that we have to have a plan for withdrawing from taxable accounts and understand that those rules are not there to limit our spending, but instead to make us aware of taxation. So we have a very similar effect with capital gains. Okay? If this couple were choosing whether or not to sell a stock that had $25,000 of capital gains this year, they would certainly want to know that on a portion of that sale, they would actually, or what portion of that, they would actually lose to federal income tax. Maybe it makes sense to sell only a part of the position this year avoiding the spike. And that also is you know, that, that crossover from one year to the other. Someone decides in December that they have a project and they want to sell some stock and use the money toward that. They may well be served to bridge that over the change of the year. So important, again, to really understand what the tax impact of withdrawing from accounts is in retirement. So there are tools for tax control. We've been trying to point out in these examples of some of the pitfalls that we might have, but what can we do in to uh, prevent ourselves from stepping into these traps? Well, we can diversify withdrawals among account types, our IRAs, our Roths, now that's not including Roth uh, conversions, that's a bit of a different subject, or non-qualified accounts, in other words, accounts in which we invested after tax income. We may want to use tax deferred products where they are appropriate. We may have tax deferred products that we can withdraw from. We may have life insurance contracts that have significant cash value. Withdrawals from those do not create any tax. Those are things that should be considered in the, in the overall picture. We want to properly blend withdrawals from different accounts. You remember we went through the um, various withdrawals that people made from accounts and saw the impact from each of those accounts and then consider which assets should be held in which account type. For most people, there still can be adjustments made even if they have retired. So we want to be sure that we understand what the tax impact will be and how we might be able to control that. Tax deferred products are, are uh, things that I think people lack information on. So you certainly want to, to inquire uh, if, about those being uh, available to you. So there's another difference between death and taxes and that death is frequently painless. I hate that thought, but it's really true. We're not going to avoid either one of them. 
and we want to make your, your uh, tax situation as predictable as possible. I think that we would all agree that we don't like to pay taxes, but we, but we do like the fact that taxes uh, provide some things that are important to us. So you need to really have a personal tax map. You really need to understand all your sources of income and see how those might affect you. The conclusion here is that you need to have a personal tax map and it varies greatly based on your uh, personal circumstances. So you can schedule an appointment with us uh, for a tax map report. We will uh, be doing this differently. We will be talking uh, to you in 15-minute uh, phone calls, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, whatever it might be, to see if, if we actually could um, better your circumstance by uh, providing a tax map. So the, this is a, uh, something we've all fought, uh, in our industry seen for many years. Sometimes people think that this judge's name was not really learned hand, but it was in fact. And he's the one who made the statement that anyone may so arrange his affairs that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He's not bound to choose that pattern, which will best pay the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. I hope that you've learned some things here that can help you. And I want to be sure that you, um, again, take advantage of the opportunity to establish an account with um, uh, AFIA, take advantage of those uh, um, calculators and tips and articles that are available. Another important thing to know is when you have an AFIA account and you're using the dashboard, if there is an, a question that occurs to you, that question will be fed from AFIA to our local chapter. And Kelly and I will actually be the people answering that question because they want to be sure that the uh, when people ask questions that they uh, have some regional connection to the people who are uh, presenting. So taxes and retirement has been brought to you by AFIA. We hope that you've learned some important factors and I encourage you to in, uh, to take advantage of that 15 to 20 minute consultation, uh, a call, a phone call. We can do Zoom if that's your uh, preference. Uh, there is uh, a link that's being provided so that you can click on that and you can select a date and time that works best for you. So uh, through modern technology, again, we are able to access um, you, might, you are able to access our calendar and choose a time that will uh, work for you.